Hello everybody. So in this lecture for chapter three, Creating a British Empire in America, 1660-1750, we're gonna look at Imperial English expansion in North America. Uh, we're gonna look at the switch from a mercantilist America to an imperial controlled economy. We'll also look at the slave economy, the slave trade, slave community, as well as the response to the slave economy. We will examine the role of colonial government uh, as opposed to the imperial governments of England. We're also gonna move around the colonies. We'll talk about the Northern colonies, New England, we'll talk about the middle colonies, the Chesapeake region and the Southern colonies, the Carolinas. Make sure you are clear. There's three different regions of colonies. Make sure you know the difference between those regions. You can make comparisons between them as well. So we'll start with the politics of empire, imperial expansion, aristocracy. So the King of England at the time, Charles II, that's him up there in the corner, ruled from 1660 to 1685. He sent eight loyal men to colonize the Carolinas. This is a land that originally had been claimed by Spain. The King of England said he wanted it. Uh, the Carolinas became official colonies, 1691. They were proprietorships. In essence, it was a land owned and given to these wealthy aristocrats. These men could rule how they wanted as long as they followed English law. The fundamental constitutions of Carolina are passed in 1669 or written. They call for a manorial system, a manorial system just like back in England, with nobles, that's the aristocrats, nobles and serfs, peasants, very much like traditional European society. It didn't happen at first. At first, it was primarily just poor Quakers, uh, poor and Quakers, runaways from other other colonies. Um, this manorial system does occur eventually, this, this system just like back in Europe. Initially they raised corn, tobacco of course, raised hogs. Uh, in South Carolina the white settlers, most of the white settlers first arrived from Barbados where they already had a slave society that had developed there. And eventually they do create this hierarchical slave society in the Carolinas by the early 1700s, just like in Barbados, that's the Caribbean, uh, initially using a lot of slave, uh, Indians as slaves, Native Americans as slaves, eventually replacing those with African slaves. They often would do trading, they would trade uh, deer skins and slaves, for rum and guns with the Native Americans. I actually find a lot of the slaves also given to them by the Native Americans. Uh, Native American tribes had slaves as well they were using, uh, and they then sold them. They sold, in essence, what the Native American tribes would do is they would take profits from trading with the Europeans. They would attack and enslave other Indian tribes and then sell them to the Europeans for more goods. Uh, rum, guns, things like this. Uh, deer skin and slaves we traded as well. William Penn, Pennsylvania, 1681. Pennsylvania becomes an official colony in 81. It was carved out of this other territory, this Carolina territory. 15,000 settlers, uh, a lot of them Quakers, not all, and many of the settlers were there already uh, before before it became a colony. Um, good relations with Native Americans, good relations with the Indians, generally speaking. Uh, this gives rise to prosperity in the Pennsylvania colonies. William Penn himself was a Quaker. Uh, this was a payment from the king. And Quakers were often persecuted in England, so this is a way of getting rid of them. He was able to get rid of thousands of Quakers in England who were challenging his authority and also pay off the debt. That is William Penn down there in the corner. Uh, Quakers were pacifists. Uh, they didn't believe in uh, violence, warfare, which was a ser serious problem in England. They didn't want to pay taxes either. Uh, 
because they knew many of their taxes were actually being used to finance warfare, finance England's war and violence. He envisioned a refuge for fellow Quakers. He envisioned, envisioned a place where Quakers could come free from persecution in England. Um, tax, they wouldn't pay taxes. I, I said that, I believe. They had this religious doctrine based on inner light. In essence, all men and women had an inner light of God, touched by God. And therefore, slavery was inappropriate. Slavery was wrong. Since all men and women were created by God, you didn't have the right to enslave someone else. Further, they believed in gender equality, generally speaking. That's best, best for the times, gender equality. Um, you see female ministers among the Quakers, hundreds of female ministers among the Quakers. So yeah, definitely a different type of group Quakers here. Frame of government was written, uh, written around, it was written I think mostly by William Penn himself, uh, written 1681. This really links the teachings of Quakerism to the political, Politics of the economy, that's the wrong way. Politics of the, uh, the colony, not the economy. Politics of the colony. Equal voting rights, well, you still had to own land. But most Quakers own land, so that was generally voting rights for all. They created a verse, uh, for the time, very egalitarian society with equal voting rights. Uh, and I don't know if that voting is cut off there we might just see vo maybe for instance but it's voting ultimately ethnically culturally religiously diverse society and all the way through the uh, probably the early mid 1800s this is the most diverse colony eventually the most diverse state it really is its geographic position is a big part of that too quakers which have such an open door policy but also the fact that its geographic position puts it there. Uh, it is right in the middle. So people that were dissatisfied with New England colonies migrated down to, to Pennsylvania, and people were dissatisfied with what becomes a slave economy migrate up. So it's interesting. So what you should get out of this is two things, really. If you look at the money here, the fact that so much more money came out of the West Indian, West Indy Islands, the Caribbean, uh, there's really two, two, two things to get from that. One, uh, it was highly productive with sugar production, so lots of money coming out of here. And number two, the fact that you have so much more profit per white person than, say, the main, mainland British colonies. And yet there's a lot of product being generated. There's a lot of money being generated. It tells you that uh, the population is primarily not white, which means it's black. And most of those are slaves. Uh, five to one, eight to one population differential there. As opposed to the mainland colonies, which are mostly white and a much smaller number of black. Uh, slave in the southern mainland, slave indentured servant in northern mainland, uh, some slave, mostly free, up in New England area. So it really tells you two significant things about the money and the, the revenue of the sugar plantations in the Caribbean and the fact that almost everybody was, was black and they were the ones doing all the labor. So the South Atlantic system, this is a system centered in Brazil and the West Indies. Primary product is sugar. Primary product, Brazil down here, West Indies here. That's Caribbean. Primary product, sugar. So what Europeans did is they provided the tools and equipment from Europe, which then therefore made uh, the slave plantations very productive. And the slave trade is really what makes the whole Atlantic system run well really what makes the whole system. Um, without the slave trade, this wouldn't have happened. So you have the tools coming from Europe, the slaves coming from Africa, and then the sugar coming out of the uh, Brazil or the Caribbean. So England really began the plantation colonies in West Indy, uh, the really West Indian uh, 
later than other other nations. Other nations were behind or ahead of England. Uh, we saw colonies in South and Central America and off the west coast of Africa for Portugal and Dutch and other countries, the French as well. Um, but eventually, eventually, um, you initially there's actually more people in the slave economy than even all of the North American colonies, white or black, initially for a while. Uh, many of the Barbados colonies start out as uh, Puritan colonies. We saw that earlier. Many of the Puritans came to Barbados, small little farms, um, small scale farming with indentured servants, white indentured servants and black. And then over time, those are purchased and bought up by larger families, larger uh, business ventures. And eventually you get dozens of farms built into these large plantations with hundreds of slaves. Uh, this is really all based because of sugar. Sugar, which is worth its weight in gold in some markets, could actually uh, equal uh, sugar and gold trade in some places. Uh, these wealthy men owned all these large plantations, uh, making sugar very common on the market and uh, very profitable. Uh, one of the most profitable crops, well, at the time, probably the most profitable crop by weight in the world. Um, Within just another century, 20% of all the calories in the world consumed are sugar. Don't even know what the number would be today. Everything has sugar in it. And it was produced from here. This is how the sugar came from. Sugar cane. The sugar plantations produce these sugar cane plants, which incredibly are labor intensive. Incredibly tough to produce and to get the sugar from the sugar cane. Very tough. Um, something most indentured servants would be unwilling to do or had a hard time getting them to do. Slaves didn't have a chance. Uh, the impact on Britain and absentee landowners. Most of the people that own this land in the Barbados, the Caribbean, and none of this is really North America we're talking about. In Barbados, the Caribbean, and South America were absentee. They lived in England and then they would appoint men to run the plantations. They would have the plantations run from a distance because they didn't want to live there. It was tropical climate and it was almost all entirely black. So they had no interest in living down there, but they certainly reaped massive profits. And of course, England did too, uh, massive revenue off of this, the slave trade itself, plus of all the products. So guns, rum, iron, cloth will be traded for slaves in Africa. And then the Africans would produce a lot more profit than what they were being bought for. And then they would take the African slaves to South America, Central America, eventually North America, and produce all of these goods. Uh, guns were one of the most biggest, biggest problems because all these guns introduced into Africa really change how Africa is. And that is really changes how the entire structure of Africa for the worse. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, slaves can be sold for massive amounts of profit, uh, three, five times more than they were purchased for. So you could take a shipload of goods from Europe to Africa, empty out your entire ship, fill it up with slaves, go to South America and make five times your profit. Sail back to Europe and do it again. Uh, this entire sugar plantation uh, society slavery this massively stimulated the british economy made england well put it this way by the mid 1700s england was the richest country in the world had the most powerful military in the world largest navy in the world it stimulated all aspects of english society made england wealthy powerful and uh greedy frankly and these were the massive amounts of profits being generated from Central, South America, and eventually North America uh, off of lots of goods, but much of it based upon the slave economy, much of the goods produced by slaves. This gives you an idea where the slaves are being taken. Uh, there were millions of slaves taken east to Asia, India, China, uh, Southeast Asia, probably 10, 15 million. But of the ones that came west, we see 10 million coming to the Americas. The largest number made it to Portuguese Brazil, 
Then you have Dutch and Spanish Central America, 2 million. The West Indies, the Caribbean, that's 3 million. And those that actually make it to North America, what eventually becomes the US, about half a million. And then about 15% died on the ships. Uh, so altogether, between East and West out of Africa, 20 to 25 million Africans, primarily men to the West, well, primarily men altogether. But you see larger numbers of women being taken east to Asia uh, as sexual slaves. This destroyed the way of life in Africa, destroyed everything. And it could be argued that Africa has still not recovered to this day uh, from Europe, Europeans exploiting Africa for everything. The natural resources plus the human resources. Uh, maybe one of the, the greatest atrocities committed in the history of humans. Probably. Uh, all, all for money. All for money. Africa, Africans in the slave trade. Warfare and slavery had historic roots in Africa. Um, uh, Africa had very limited resources, so warfare was common for limited resources. Uh, and slavery was also common. Africa still lived in the past. The rest of the world had, most of the rest of the world had moved on. Uh, Africa still lived, well, I mean, there's still parts of Africa that lived basically in the Stone Age. So they still lived in the past. Well, in the past, there was slavery everywhere. All societies had slavery with standard practice. So there's nothing unusual, but the Africans, they were just still living in the past when everyone else had really moved forward technologically. Um, it's not surprising. Slavery, there was also different there though. Slavery in Africa was, it wasn't permanent. Slavery was usually for, we could do to war. And then even if it was due to war, eventually they would, they would accept you into the society, you'd marry in, you'd become part of the society. Um, and uh or for debt debt slavery both the two reasons that most people were slaves in ancient history were for debt or war it also wasn't permanent you could work your way out of slavery buy your way out of slavery you could marry out of slavery uh it wasn't a permanent condition either so even though this historic roots are there as it had been everywhere in the world it was a much different kind of slavery than what happens in europe in America, European American slavery is uh, they're in chains. It's violent. It's permanent. Uh, it's a way of exploiting. They don't, they don't get to marry out of it. You don't get to buy your way out of it. It's a much different type of slavery. Uh, conquering regions and selling people off for profit was well it was highly profitable. Uh, this was a way of making profit, selling to the Europeans. They, uh, it creates many warring states in Africa, creates lots of violence in Africa. Um, Europeans were sending over 300,000 guns a year. That was a year. Yeah. 300,000 guns a year in Africa. It destabilizes the entire continent, creates nothing less than continual warfare, which is really often the way it still is today in parts of Africa. Uh, continual warfare and violence. Uh, much of the participation was by choice, but it was the rich and wealthy, again, as it has always been. The rich and wealthy, African warlords, and elites taking advantage of the poor. So whether it's Europe, America, South America, Africa, Asia, it really doesn't matter where you are in the world. It's always the same freaking story. Rich and wealthy taking advantage of the poor. It's no different. Um, in that way, Africa was just like the rest of the world. And so the rich and wealthy Africans get money, get power and status. They then build armies. They go then conquer other tribes and other villages and other peoples, enslave them and sell them to the Europeans for more profit and money and weapons. And the cycle repeats. Uh, millions and millions endured slavery uh, internally in Africa as well. We talk often about how the Africans are taken out uh, and taken into other places for slavery. It should be noted that, that Africa was full of plantations itself, especially the West Coast. Uh, gold mines, salt mines, other goods. So slavery and plantation life was also common 
on the continent, um, all through the continent, uh, by African warlords, but also Europeans. A lot of Europeans would own and control the plantations, especially on the west coast of Africa, controlled by Europeans, west and the central coast. Uh, matter of fact, the entire central coast of Africa at one point was claimed by the Portuguese, I, I believe. No, I'm wrong about that. I think it was the Belgians. It was the Belgians, the Belgian Congo. The entire central western part of Africa was claimed by Belgium. And it was full of plantations run by the Belgians, which is Europe, right next to right there between France and Germany. And they ran it for years as their own personal plantation in Central Africa, making massive amounts of profit off of it. So why even ship the Africans out to other places when you can simply build your own plantation economy right in Central Africa, as the Belgians did? Anyway, as I also said, many of them went to the East as well. We see millions of Africans uh, taken East uh, into uh, the Middle East, Asia, China, India, Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, probably more taken east than west out of Africa. And female slavery was very common east, uh, sexual slavery, prostitution, forced slavery. The Middle Passage was the name of this route from Africa um, into the Americas. You can see these images here, actual pictures of what it was like. Uh, they were stacked in. They weren't human. They weren't treated as humans. They were treated as property. Uh, they had to live in their own feces, vomit, chain, starve, dehydrated. 15% died uh, on the trip to the West. Uh, they simply weren't treated as human. They were treated as, as product. They were treated as a commodity. You know, you'd like to say that things like this don't happen today. They do. Not exactly like this, but this dehumanization, this treatment of others as 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 worthless, as having no value, it still happens today. Slavery is still a thing in the world today. All country, it's illegal everywhere. No country has legalized slavery. But it's thought that there's probably millions of slaves, especially Southeast Asia, uh, sexual slaves, fishing boat slaves. Uh, people chained onto boats for years at a time. Um, sexual slavery, of course. Hell, it even exists in the United States. We know this stuff still happens. Not to this scale that we saw out of Africa. Nothing like that, but it still happens. Makes you wonder how humans can treat other humans like that. This just shows you coming out of Africa. It shows where people are coming from. Uh, it shows where they're taken from. Uh, the Slave Coast, appropriately named. Gold Coast, Ivory Coast, named for the goods being taken out. Millions here, millions here. And it shows coming to America where they're going to. Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, the number one uh, destination for uh, uh, kidnapped slaves was... Uh, Portuguese Brazil here. S uh, the South America, the Northern South America, Mexico, the Caribbean, all through the Caribbean, and then eventually being brought to the Americas after everywhere else. Eventually it makes it up to uh, what is the British colonies and eventually the United States. The trade depots in the U.S., originally it's Charleston. Charleston is the center of the trade, uh, slave trade in, in North America. And then once New Orleans becomes part of North America, becomes part of the U.S., uh, uh, New Orleans becomes a central trading point as well, even before it becomes part of the U.S. The central trading depots, if I didn't say it before, in Europe was Lisbon, Portugal, initially. And then when England really starts to realize how much profit is involved in it, England takes over the trade and the center of the slave, slave trade and the, uh, the slave yards in Europe become Liverpool, Liverpool, England. Home of the Beatles, I think. I don't know why that came to mind. So next we'll look at slavery in the Chesapeake, slavery in the South, Caro, in, uh, South Carolina. So in the Chesapeake region, we have elite planters 
politicians, elite planter politicians, sort of lead what we call this tobacco revolution, which occurs in the Chesapeake region. Um, what they did was they took advantage of the value of tobacco, how much money it was, to lead this revolution, which am amounts to stopping using indentured servants and sort of push white people out. The rich white landowners start buying up all the land and they replace the whites, the independent farmers or the tenant farmers with black slaves. So it's the rich in essence, finding a way to take more and more land and power from common poor whites and control it themselves and replace those whites with African slaves. Um, pretty crazy. Uh, it's again, simply about money. It's simply about generating wealth and money for the rich. Another situation of the rich taking advantage of the poor. By the mid 1700s, almost half the entire Chesapeake population was black. They're not all slave. Remember there were black and church servants. So you do have a handful of free blacks. But by 1740, 1750, most of those that were black were actually slaves. This expands to the Virginia, it expands to Maryland, uh, which is the Chesapeake region, and increasingly labor on farms and plantations is black and slave. And we are starting to associate black with slave and black with servitude. And so slavery becomes synonymous with black. Um, getting to the point where by the mid late 1700s, if you were black, you were simply assumed to be a slave. They weren't. Eventually about 10%, about 10% of the black population was not slave. But if you were seen as a black person, you were simply assumed to be a slave. Um, the working conditions weren't that bad. It actually was, the, the working conditions for slavery in the 1700s in the Chesapeake region, we believe historically were very similar to a typical poor white farmer. We see very little evidence of slaves being used in chains, or large-scale violence um, compared to everywhere else there's slavery. Africa, Carolinas, Barbados, South America. Compared to everywhere else, we would generally consider slavery in the Chesapeake region to be, uh, to be far less violent, less death, slower, uh, more reasonable. As we'll talk about in a later section, a later chapter, many people in the Chesapeake region sort of saw slaves as part of the extended family. Now they were slaves. This isn't trying to sugarcoat it or gloss over it. They were slaves. They were treated, they were expected to be subservient and obedient. However, that is also the way servants were expected to be for the wealthy. Servants were to be obedient and uh, submissive and like this. It just really isn't that much different in the Chesapeake region of Virginia. Just about everywhere else, it is worse. It is really the more classic picture we think of slavery, the violence, the torture, the beating, the chains. We'll see more of that, especially we talk about South America, Carolinas, uh, Barbados. It just wasn't as bad in this region. Life expectancy was longer too. Um, life expectancy was actually pretty good uh, in this region. Uh, we think blacks and whites, common whites, lived about the same amount of lifetime as black slaves. Uh, less heat, less punishment than Carolinas or Indies, still slavery. So still misery, still death, still slavery, just less of it. And it was less violent than we see in other regions. Sexual relations were prohibited, generally speaking, um, between black, black or black, white, either one initially. 
one of the surest ways to get yourself in trouble as a, as a slave would be to have relations with a white person. Uh, we have records of it happening, and usually they would be imprisoned or executed, tortured. Um, eventually, by the late 1700s, they start to encourage Africans to have sexual relations. By 1800, the numbers of slaves being imported into America, really small. And yet the slave population is growing, uh, expanding rapidly due to natural reproduction, natural reproduction, much cheaper. Natural reproduction is much cheaper than buying slaves and importing them from Africa. Um, we think by 1800, the majority of slaves, no, we don't think, we know. The majority of slaves in America, the United States by this point in time, are born here, naturally born. Uh, by the time of the Civil War, like 99%, 98% are born here. Importation of slavery from outside, importation of slaves from outside the country is pretty much non-existent by the mid-1800s. Carolina, worse. Carolina is more the slavery of the movies. Harsh, wet, violent, more brutality, lots of dangers. Um, it grew very slowly. Slavery grew very slowly in the Carolinas. Even though it was being adopted from Barbados, and they sort of brought that up from Barbados, as many people would trans had um, migrated from Barbados as the British colonies expanded. Uh, they had a hard time finding a crop that would grow well there. Eventually they do. Rice. Eventually, they find a crop that grows very well there, very profitable as rice. But 80% of the population by the mid-1700s was African, almost all slave, outnumbering whites, what, four to one, five to one. Um, dangerous work, lots of swamp, lots of, uh, is it alligators that we have in America? The American alligator or is it crocodile? I think it's alligator. Uh, alligators, uh, people worked in water all day long, so it was common to get foot diseases, um, uh, mosquito-borne illnesses, infections. Life expectancy was much lower in the Carolinas. People died years earlier, on average, than in the Chesapeake region. Uh, and most of the labor, almost all the labor done in the Carolinas, Almost all of it was being done by African slaves, as opposed to the Chesapeake region, only by half the labor was done by African slaves, and the other half the labor was done by regular white farmers. Uh, slavery was there; it was significant, but it was seen as more equitable. Um, you also see in the Chesapeake region; it's not uncommon to see slaves working in the fields alongside whites. White farmers working, uh, you, you're much more likely to see regular people, more common people, owning one or two slaves. Well, you can't run a farm with one or two slaves. Therefore, if you're a farmer and you have one or two slaves, you have to actually be out there working next to them, side by side. Another reason why we think it was much less violent and much less much dangerous was the whites worked alongside the slaves doing the same exact work. And secondly, if you have a farm family of five or six people and you've got one or two slaves, you have to trust them. And so you have to treat them better. You have to treat them more fairly. Because, I mean, you're right there face to face with them all day long. If you treat them terribly, what's to keep them from attacking you, rebelling against you, stabbing you at night? I mean, the reality is, you simply have to treat them nicer so they treat you nicer. Um, and yeah, the idea of chains and stuff like that, that didn't really exist in the, the Virginia region, the Chesapeake, Virginia region. We didn't really see that. The rest of the areas, it really starts to develop. Just doesn't really take hold there. Um, that type of slavery. This is a chart shows you the black white population in 1700 equal this is carolina this is carolina by 1740 we see white population here 
and the black population double the white population by 1740. And they're the ones doing all the labor. They're the ones doing most of the work. Uh, by 1800, 80% of the labor force is black, almost entirely slave. Any idea of equality or egalitarianism or fairness is gone. You still see that in Virginia region, Chesapeake region, but you don't get any of that here. It's, it's, it is a purely slave, brutal economy that develops from the Carolinas on down through Georgia, uh, all and down to Florida, eventually when we're in Florida. This is a photo uh, of slaves working a rice plantation. So you've got, what, 20 people out there uh, working um, rice fields all day long. Wet, hot, humid conditions, mosquitoes, bugs, alligators. Uh, in water all day long, people getting diseases and infections from having their feet submerged in water all day. It's bad. And this is one of the things that, how to put it, one of the things that made the African slave rice plantation so successful is Africans were already used to doing this. Well, a very common practice in tropical Africa was rice, was using rice. Rice was a staple product, meaning an everyday used product. So many Africans were already very experienced producing rice, rice production. Uh, these are women that are hulling rice. If you're unaware, rice actually comes in a shell when it's, when it's grown. You have to actually hit it and break open the shell and then what you eat when you, you know, you eat dinner, you eat rice, that's the inside, sort of the inside part of it. It's almost like a, almost like a fruit or a nut or something. You got to crack open the shell. Well, that's hulling. You put it in a big container and you beat on it and it cracks open the shell. Then you have to separate them. It's actually pretty, pretty labor intensive. Um, so Africans, many of them were already, now I like tobacco. They were not. Tobacco was a totally separate thing. They weren't used to growing tobacco. They were used to doing rice which actually made it worse because it was much easier to transplant them from Central Africa to, to, the, to the Caribbean and to Carolina because they were already experienced and knew how to do this. So it actually makes the impetus to create this slave society based on rice even stronger and easier because they already knew what they were doing. Many Africans already knew how to do this. It was part of their society already. So uh, the image shows you West Africa and Georgia, and there's actually a second picture with this, uh, which I don't have on the slide. It's almost identical. The difference is in Africa, they're doing it for themselves, for their families, their communities. And of course, in America, they're doing it for profit, uh, for white masters and the economy. Another thing here, which is interesting, with all of the desire of Americans and Europeans to destroy African culture. Let me say that differently. It wasn't about destroying African culture. It was about having no regard for African culture. Not the same thing. Maybe the similar effect, but it wasn't the same thing. They just didn't care about African culture. Most whites and, and Europeans and Americans, it just didn't matter to them. Africans do their utmost best to maintain their culture to maintain their, their way of life as best they can as a slave. They try. Um, many of them bring over the traditional cultural beliefs, religious beliefs, um, societal beliefs. This right here is a wedding. Um, this is a long tradition in world society. I have no idea where it came from, but uh, this was a tradition that we, where it's sort of symbolic. You would step over a uh, broomstick, for instance, and it was a symbol of you stepping over like a threshold into a new world, stepping over into this threshold of this new, uh, this new relationship. You were separate people before, you step over the broomstick and now you're a partnership, you're together. Africans are not allowed to get married in America as slaves. However, many of them still did. 
in their own way, in their own society, even if it wasn't technically official. This idea of stepping over. We still have this tradition today, and it really shows so many different traditions that we have in our society. We don't really talk about it in this chapter, or we don't talk about it all in this class, actually. In the other class, the second half of U.S. history, we actually talk about how much of American culture is actually based on African culture. Music and writing, literature, um, so many things in our culture really come from African or Black uh, American culture, really does. Almost all modern music can be tied or traced back to that. Well, this is the tradition we still have today. Uh, it's traditional, like when you step over, you get married and you go into a new home, you step over the threshold of the home. Uh, if you've ever heard of like carrying the bride in through the door or carrying the bride, uh, something like that, the same kind of thing. You are now a partnership moving forward. You're no longer separate. We also see in this image music, drinking, alcohol. Um, Africans were allowed to maintain many of their cultural traditions as long as it didn't interfere with work, as long as it didn't interfere with them producing product, uh, goods. They were allowed to have sometimes parties, gatherings, uh, religion, things like this. It should be noted, the further south you went, the worse it was. So like in the Carolina, in uh, the Virginia region, it was common for things like this to occur. Remember, many of the Virginia slave owners saw themselves as sort of the benevolent masters. They were there to take care of their children, and that included slaves. The further, further your south you got down, Carolinas, Georgia, Central South America, slavery is much more harsh. It was much more simply about profit. It's interesting. You can learn a lot uh, about African culture, the way it translates into America, and how it maintains, how they're able to maintain their cultural beliefs but also adapts and also changes. It's very interesting. Uh, clothing in this image reflects African cultures, head coverings, the bare feet, uh, English cult culture, the dresses, men's formal jackets. That is English culture. So you have this real um, syncretism of blending of two cultures. Bottom line, Africans tried to maintain as much of their, nat their, their traditional culture as possible in this new world whenever they could. And at times they were forced to assimilate and do what the Americans or the Europeans wanted them to do. They had to walk the line. Slaves, what it was to be a slave, uh, a little more specific here, a little more detailed. Slaves denied education. They were denied the accumulation of wealth, uh, total control. They also weren't to associate with others, uh, anyone off the plantation. Uh, limited association with each other as well, except when they were in their off period, when they were off work. Uh, punishments included whippings, as this sketch down here has in the corner. Punishments included whippings. Uh, other forms of torture, um, amputation of body parts, cutting off fingers and toes was common. Things that they thought would not interfere with work. Uh, white violence was very common. Um, uh, white violence was less, the fewer slaves there were. As I said, in the northern colonies where there were slaves, slaves were treated a lot more equitably. A lot fewer slaves, and you were much more likely to have common people owning a slave. And so slaves were treated more like the family. Still had to be obedient, but they were treated much more fairly. Slave uh, white people would be hired um, as slave patrols to keep an eye on slaves, especially at night to look for runaway slaves. This was sort of a beginning of an establishment of how they would take the poor 
which your typical poor white person lived a very similar life to a poor slave person. So how do you differentiate them? They live very similar. They live, they live and eat and they, they sleep and they wear similar clothes as your typical poor white or poor slave in Virginia. Again, when you get down to Carolinas, it, it's, it's more different. Uh, slaves are treated worse and, and given even fewer resources. But in the Chesapeake region, they're a little more equitable. And so how do you differentiate? If their lives on a daily basis are similar, you have to you have to create some type of a society to where whites understand they're still superior and above black. So slave patrol is one of the way to do this, to really create this idea of that whites are superior to blacks. Uh, whites can dominate blacks, whether you're a slave or not. You can beat or abuse a slave if you have cause. They have no rights. Uh, slaves would occasionally try to barter for freedom. It does happen occasionally. Uh, this wasn't actually that uncommon. Um, thousands of slaves were given freedom in the Virginia, for instance. Uh, they were, it's called manumission. Thousands of slaves were manumitted in Virginia over the years. Thousands, tens of thousands, actually. Um, even though indentured servitude might not be official anymore, many slave owners treated slaves as indentured servants. Meaning they were a servant, they had to work for him for several years, but after five or 10 years, they would let him go. Virginia slavery was really different than just about everywhere else. Uh, everywhere else, I mean, slavery is still slavery, but just about everywhere else, slaves were treated worse, treated harsher, treated more violently than the Chesapeake region. Might try to barter for freedom. They might actually try to run away. You could run away, lots of places, especially Virginia. If you go north of Virginia, you find territories that aren't very many slaves. Uh, you could go out to the frontier. Um, if you could make it on the frontier, you could get away and live maybe your whole life on the frontier. Uh, if you had been a slave, you could get away with that. Um, go, go and join an Indian tribe, an Indian village. We actually have evidence of that. Um, Africans uh, escaping and running away and joining Indians. Um, if you were light-skinned enough, you were very light-skinned African, especially if you were a descendant of a white master and a female slave, and you had very light skin. You might even be able to pass as a free as a, as a as a um, as a free person if you could somehow get an education and learn how to read and write. You could pass the free black. Uh, most did not have that ability to do that, but if you could somehow do that. This was a time before they required you to have papers. In the next couple generations, you have to have papers at all times if you're black, free or not, you have to carry papers. Uh, but in this point in time, not the case. In this point in time, they hadn't gotten there yet in the 1700s. So if you could get to an area where most blacks were free, say like Massachusetts, you could simply pass the free black, assuming you had some type of education to read and write that so that you didn't make it obvious that you were a slave um let's see what else you want to say here uh, yeah there were rebellions none successful there was no successful rebellion in north america there was one in central there was one in central america in um haiti there was a successful rebellion in haiti but nothing in north america uh, rebellions actually were very uncommon too, probably because the punishment was so severe. Whenever rebellion occurred, they would execute everybody involved or torture everybody involved. It was, it was bad. It became very common knowledge by the mid 1700s. If you chose to participate in a rebellion, there were really only two outcomes. Either you got away or you died. Uh, a handful would get away. They'd run away and escape. There was never an ever overthrow of white society that never even came close, even though some tried that. Stono Rebellion, South Carolina, 1739. The governor of Spanish Florida caused this. 
The governor of Spanish Florida, this was when Spain and England were, were, were at war with each other, as happened multiple times. They were constantly at odds with each other. Well, Florida was controlled by Spain. Just above that is the Carolinas, controlled by England. So England and Spain always were getting into each other, and Spain was really mad. Spain had been the first in the Americas, and England was now taking away their land. That Spain claimed was theirs, England was taking chunks of it. So Spain was mad. Uh, so the Spanish governor announces, makes a public announcement, and lets people, lets people up in the Carolinas know that if you run away as a slave, I will protect you. I'll take care of you. Uh, we'll bring you down, and um, and we'll give you freedom in Spain, Spanish Florida. So we start seeing uh, as slaves running away from the Carolinas. Carolinas is pretty harsh. Carolinas is worse than, say, Virginia. Much more violent more torture, um, harsher working conditions, less life expectancy. Uh, and so we see people running away. Well, this war between England and Spain leads to lots of unrest, leads to lots of revolt. And with the Spanish governor's announcement that if you make it to, to Spanish Florida, we'll set you free. Um, and they even were offering them to be soldiers, which was even more of an enticement, honestly. Hey, come down here. We'll give you a gun and let you go and kill Car Carolinians. We'll let you go kill white Car Carolinians, I guess is the word. Um, so, several whites near the Stono River, uh, whites, yes, uh, several whites uh, assist them. I guess, okay, the, the blacks are the ones that are actually running away and doing this, but we see white assistance in this. Most rebellions had white assistance, should be noted. There was usually some white, um, what's the term when, you, when you're when you basically a collaborator? Usually most rebellions, because there were multiple rebellions, uh, all unsuccessful, had white collaborators. So the whites get this news to several black people uh, in around near the Stono River and letting them know that they could escape to freedom. Um, who knows, they might have been spies from Spain. It's hard, hard to know. Um, they get together, they march down to Florida with musical instruments. Yeah. They actually march down there with musical instruments and making lots of noise and racket. And I guess the purpose of it was hoping they would start a widespread rebellion or they would have people come out and join them. Ultimately, all they did was let their pursuers, the ones chasing them down, know where they were. They captured them, they executed them, and uh, it was ugly. It was really bad. Had they just snuck away in the dead of night like many others did, they probably could have gotten to Florida safely. But their idea was to, I guess their idea was to create a, a mass rebellion, which did not materialize. People understood the penalties for rebellion, torture, if not death. So I guess you had to weigh being a slave was it worse than dying or being tortured? As a slave, you can live. As a slave, you can maybe still have relationships. You might even be able to have family. You could make a semblance of a life. I mean, what other choice did you have other than death? Some people, of course, decided death was better, which is understandable. Um, especially if you're someone who's abused a lot, especially if you're someone who is, uh, we know some slaves were, were singled out and purposely abused and tortured more than others. Uh, we think most likely it was to set an example. Uh, abuse one slave to get the other 10 to fall in line because they don't want to be tortured. Um, if you're that one who's getting abused and tortured, maybe you would, maybe it's worse the risk of dying. I guess that makes sense. It certainly does make sense. So the elite wanted to the elite, the elite upper class, the aristocrats, the lords. They really wanted to create a, a way to stop any type of uprising from poor whites as well. We've really been talking about black uprisings here. Well, well, if you were poor white, life sucked too. It wasn't as bad as being a slave, but honestly, it wasn't much better. Being a poor whites had limited food. They were often starving, malnourished. They were treated violently by the upper class whites, the wealthy whites. Uh, they had 
limited access to any type of health care, any type of education. Um, uh, poor whites often didn't have shoes. I mean, the life of a poor common white in Carolina really, it just wasn't much different from that much of a slave. You know, you didn't get beaten every day or tortured, but honestly, it was common for whites to beat or hit or, or punish servants, white servants. So truth be told, the life of a poor white was pretty shitty as well. And most, most whites that were in Carolina were poor. And so there was always this fear of whites uprising. There was always a, weird, a fear of white revolts uh, and white violence. The difference is among whites, even though there were a lot more blacks, Whites had access to weapons. Whites had access to, they had free access to all parts of society so they could plan, they could, they had political access limited. So truth be told, um, truth be told, aristocratic upper, upper class whites, the lords in Carolina on those manorial systems, probably feared poor white uprisings more than poor black uprisings, more than slave uprisings. So one of the ways to get away from this and to quell this desire to rise up against the, the upper class is to create a white identity, to create what it is that how white is superior to black. Um, they did this in many different ways. They would lower taxes uh, on poor whites. They would bribe them with rum, money, jobs, some type of local political office, like, you know, a uh, slave catcher, sheriff, uh, slave patrol, um, or even maybe help them get a slave. Uh, help them have a, have a poor white family be able to get their own one slave so they could have their own slave so they could really buy into this idea of white society superior to black society. If all the poor whites and poor blacks got together, that was 95% of the population. They could have easily overthrown the white uh, minority at the top, all the ones living this lifestyle of the Southern gentry, which is basically the Southern aristocrat. The ones who dress like this, you know, if you ever seen Gone with the Wind, the ones that lived in the big mansions, the ones who had the cotillions and the parties, uh, they dressed in white and they, they lived this fancy lifestyle. They only lived that way off of the labor of the poor blacks and poor whites. That's how they were able to live that type of lifestyle. Uh, all the wealth generated from having all the servants and slaves. Uh, they lived in fancy homes. They lived this elaborate lifestyle. Uh, they refer to this as gentility. You were, it was the art of gentility, fancy. They loved wearing white and light colors. The indication of that was they don't get dirty. They don't work for a living. You can't walk around wearing white all the time if you do some job that's gonna get you dirty. So you would dress like that in the light colors, the pastels, the whites, fancy clothes, fancy furnish furnishings. This fancy refined lifestyle of parties and gatherings. Uh, they modeled themselves on the behavior of the English aristocrats, but they wanted the to be an aristocrat as a farmer. English aristocrats didn't really weren't really in charge of farming. Uh, however, here in America, you are now in a, what we start calling a planter aristocrat. You are this refined lifestyle of nobility, self-made nobility, because they're not officially any any nobility. They're not officially part of any royal family. They treat themselves like that, though they act like that. They act like they're sort of Southern royalty because of their power, their status, their accoutrements, uh, their clothing, their uh, housing, things like this. Um, they want to consider themselves to be the aristocratic royalty of America. And that's how they acted. Uh, these are the Southern gentry we're talking about here. Uh, they would send their boys to England. There were colleges in America, but no, that wasn't good enough. Uh, they had to send their boys to get a school, a proper education in England, for instance. 
they had tutors, uh, private tutors for their daughters. You didn't send your daughters away uh, to make them more desirable as wives. Uh, your job was never to work as a woman in the aristocratic life. Your job was to be married to a wealthy man and live the life like in this bottom picture, uh, this fancy life of parties. Um, the women deferred to men on pretty much all issues. That's something that's word I don't think I've used yet. This was a patriarchal society, male dominated and patriarchal. It was white dominated, obviously, but it was also male dominated. And to be truthful, a lot of women would write in their diaries that they felt like slaves. Now, did they really know what it was to be a slave? No. Uh, but they felt in their view that they were slaves uh, to this society being dominated by the men and had to, they themselves being treated as subservient, uh, second class status. Um, social networks were important for women. It's about the only networks they had were social networks of other women and groups, parties. So ultimately, they use all this status, all this wealth to create a patriarchal, dominant, male-led, white-dominated society that we could use the term white supremacy. They create a white supremacist society, a patriarchal white supremacist society dominated by white men. Um, and they were unwilling to give it up no matter what. This here is one of the causes of the Civil War. Not, we don't use this as a, as a cause of the Civil War. We don't say this is, you know, why Southern gentry is what caused the Civil War. But what comes out of this, this idea of white supremacy, uh, white dominance over black, black inferiority, um, and they become so bought into this lifestyle of whiteness versus blackness that the idea of ending it is simply unthinkable. And to end slavery would mean they would have, all this would have to collapse. Um, they believed it will have to collapse. It does change dramatically when slavery ends, but it doesn't collapse completely. But they believe it will. And they're willing to die for it. Poor or rich are willing to die to, in, to continue to propagate, if that's the right word, this white supremacist society. They're willing to do anything to maintain it. Initially, it was created by the upper class whites. They're the ones that create this racist society for pure purposes of power and status. But over, over time, this racism that begins at the upper echelon eventually gravitates down and disseminates through all whites in the Southern society. And whether you're poor or rich, this idea of white versus black becomes ingrained into the psyche of the Southerners. And I'm from the South. I used to live down there. And let me tell you, even in modern times, this still is there. This white versus black, this idea of white supremacy and white authority still exists in the southern states, even till today, to a degree. That just shows how powerful it was. Hundreds of years later, we can still see this in southern society. Crazy, really, uh, that this still exists. Next, we'll talk about the northern maritime economy. Uh, this is primarily going to focus on northern urban areas, urban cities. Now, we already talked about the, the southern maritime economy, basically the South Atlantic system, talking about slavery. You should understand that that entire southern maritime, that entire South Atlantic system was completely connected to the northern Atlantic system. And that's what this is. The Northern Maritime, that is like a ocean trade, maritime meaning ocean economy, meaning a water-based economy. The entire Northern Maritime economy, even though it doesn't really deal with slave trade, the goods and products that are both produced and sold, imported as well, really pretty much import-export, is largely associated or based upon the Southern slave economy. 
So the economy of the entire Atlantic, north and south, the southern slave and the northern maritime are linked, very much linked. They didn't start that way initially, but by the 1700s, they're linked. So where does the money come from that really fuels the northern maritime economy? Guess where it comes from? It really comes from the slave trade. The slave trade generates massive amounts of wealth, and the merchants, if you're a business person, what do you, what do you desire to do? You desire to expand your profit, expand your market. You desire to make more money, have more customers. So if you are becoming rich and wealthy off of the slave economy, it's only natural that you start to expand into other trade networks. Therefore, much of the wealth which really generates and creates the northern maritime economy is really based upon the slave economy. The money, much of the money comes from that. It really creates lots of wealthy fortunes, wealthy industry, all influenced by the trade. And the trade is to feed and clothe and support the slave economy. It's a weird irony, or maybe hypocrisy is a better word. Northerners hated the slave economy. Even by the mid-1700s, Northerners were talking about how the slave economy is terrible, slavery is terrible, how could you do that to people, especially Northern congregational Christians around the Massachusetts area? Incredibly um, critical of the whole slave economy. And talking about how terrible it was, and how terrible it was for slavery, and how can you treat people like that? The hypocrisy there is. Half of all products and goods from the northern colonies, which didn't really have slavery, which criticized slaves, were directly sold to the slave economy, to fuel the slave economy. They didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about how, oh, uh, publicly and in all their little salons and in their, their little circles and on the streets, slavery is terrible. We hate slavery. How can you treat people like that? They don't talk about then they go back to their shops and businesses and their warehouses and they sell goods that are produced by slaves. And then they sell goods that go down to feed and clothe slaves. The tools. Um, it's hypocrisy, really. Uh, but it should be noted that at least half of the entire northern maritime economy was directly linked to the slave trade and the slave society and slave economy. Uh, cities do develop in the north. We see large cities develop in the north that we don't really see. Now, these aren't all just in the north. These are just in, in the Atlantic. Uh, Boston reaching a whopping 15,000 people. Woohoo! Um, New York, 20,000, Charleston, 10, Philadelphia was the biggest city in the British colonies with 30,000 people. That's a whopper. We have community colleges with more students than that. That's <laughs> more than 30,000 students today. It's just a different world. Um, the large amount of manufacturing produced in the North, factories, refineries, distilleries, uh, this is the first industrial revolution uh, for America. England had already, had already had it, but this is our first industrial revolution period. And we're producing all these goods in these places which are run by uh, coal, most of it run by coal and steam or simply water power. And we see the growth of many large cities. Of course, we see lots of smaller towns and communities develop as well around these large cities. And the goods, many of the goods produced in these large uh, new urban areas are really fueling the maritime economy. Let's see. Uh, Massachusetts, molasses. Millions of gallons of molasses every year. What do you use molasses for? Think about it for a second. Syrup on your pancakes? Well, yeah, I suppose. Uh, the number one use of molasses was in the distilleries. To make rum. Yeah, molasses distilleries to make rum, but you can also make sugar from it. An, an alternative method of making sugar instead of sugar cane, you can make sugar out of the molasses as well. Cod, of course, you know, fish. Um, let's see, mackerel and cod coming out of New England, the different New England ports, I think like Massachusetts area. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, right close to Washington, D.C. 
Uh, although there's no Washington, D.C. yet at this point, is there? Export wheat, flour, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, deer skins, rice. New Hampshire, up in New England again. Wood, uh, sawmills, wood, things like that. Pennsylvania, wood products. So it gives you an idea to different places, exporting different goods. Lots and lots of money to be made. The wood, the deer skins, cod, wheat, molasses, a lot of this would go right directly into the slave economy. Either going down there to provide for the slaves because you wanted the slaves making cash crops. You didn't want them making stuff. Uh, it was actually much cheaper, much cheaper to import almost everything you needed for slaves, tools, food, clothing, and then have the slaves produce other goods like sugar or tobacco. So it was more profitable to buy all the stuff you needed so that the slaves could focus entirely on making the cash crops and not making their own clothes or food. Kind of crazy, really. Well, with all this money floating around, we start to see a real development of urban society for the first time in America. We've seen urban society develop, dominated primarily, and this is really one thing that makes it unique. In England, urban society is dominated by the wealthy aristocrats, the wealthy landowners. In America, the wealthy and the, the urban um, wealth and status is really dominated by merchants. In essence, the people making all the money off of this trade are the ones who are the, with the status in the North. In the South, it's the same as in England. The wealth and status is based on land ownership. In the North, it's not though. On the north, everybody has a little piece of land. Some, of course, have more than others. But there's a lot more equality when it comes to land. In the north, your real status and wealth is based upon trade and merchant. It isn't about aristocrats, not about gentry, it's not about genteel living. It's simply about generating money, generating status, uh, money and status coming from that. We have the middle ranks. Middle ranks are your shopkeepers, your artisans, your um, your your entrepreneurs, generally speaking. And of course, your, your, your farmers as well, your middle-class farmers. We refer to yeoman. That's Y-E-O-M-A-N, yeoman farmers. That's sort of your middle-class farmers. Um, that's your middle ranks, shopkeepers. Uh, artisans, many of your artisans. That's someone who's a craftsperson. You know, someone who is an artist, a woodworker, a metal worker, something like that. And the way you learn those crafts was your parents would teach you. You would apprentice to your family or friends, your parents, and you'd be taught. So if you were a wood craftsman, you would teach that to your kids. And that would put you in the middle ranks. That would put you as independent middle rank, able to take care of you and your family. The lowest class of laborers, which usually included very poor whites. Uh, enslaved blacks, and yes, there were slaves in the North, limited, very small population, probably 5% of the population. But you did have uh, slaves in the North, and you also had quite a few free blacks, much, much larger number of free black uh, in the North, further North you got. Lots, still a significant chunk of poor whites as well, your laborers. Um, poor white people, generally did labor building the ships, labor in the factories, working in the distilleries. If you lived in a rural area outside the city, you were probably independent and at least a middle rank, independent farmer. Um, if you lived in the city, you were more likely to be either the wealthy merchant or the poor laborer working on the ships in the factories, in the distilleries, in the refineries. Uh, with the exception of your small group of educated middle class, like lawyers, doctors, things like that. Uh, women, uh, gender distinctions are very specific. The factories, the distilleries, and the fineries, those are for men. Pretty much no women. So what did women do? Women did domestic work, cooking, cleaning, child care, housekeeping. Women are prostitutes. The best paid job a woman could get at the time was prostitution. Uh, they would spin wool. They would do what we would call textiles, things to do with clothing. They would make clothes, 
they would spin wool, they would spin into thread, they would make cloth, uh, servants, domestic work. So the men did the laboring and the factory work and the women did what we will start to call women's work. Uh, the only work women could get that they could be allowed to do and actually make some money were those things I just mentioned. This is what we call the triangle trade system. This is the system of trade between the three points of the triangle are the Americas. That's one point. Europe is a two point and Africa is a third point. The raw materials came from America. The manufactured goods came out of Europe and the slaves came out of Africa. And they would simply trade along the three points of the triangle. Raw materials from America going to England and Africa, African slaves going to Europe and America, and the manufactured goods coming from Europe being sold to America or being sold to Africa to purchase more slaves to be brought to the Americas. And this chart also shows you many of the goods. Manufactured goods, tobacco, indigo, flour, molasses, sugar, salt, wine, slaves, um, let's see, rum, rice, fish. Indigo is a dye, it's a color. I think it's like reddish, I think. Or is in, indigo is like a reddish purple or hell, I don't know. It's a color. Lumber. And you can see the ports. Boston, Newport, I think that's Rhode Island, Baltimore, Maryland, Chesapeake region, Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, and of course the West Indies. The last topic we'll look at is the rise of colonial assemblies and salutary neglect. I'll cover both. So uh, by the early 1700s, the assemblies, these were the government. This was the government. Pretty much all colonies had these. This is sort of a forerunner of, you know, like Congress, our legislative branches. And that's what it would look like, that picture there. There's 20 or 30 elite men sitting around discussing the colony, discussing the rules of the colony, the laws of the colonies, uh, how the colonies should be run, and how the economy should be run in each colony. The assemblies primarily were comprised of the elite, the wealthy, either wealthy landowners or wealthy merchants, and usually educated. So landowners or merchants and usually educated in either one. They had the status, the wealth. Now, most of them were elected positions. However, there's a caveat with that. If the only people running for office are rich and wealthy people, then that means your only elected officials are the rich and wealthy. Um, and I know I always use those like rich and wealthy, rich and wealthy, when they're really the same thing. Um, I just stay out of habit. Um, if they're the only people running for office, then that's who you get. Common people often do not run for office. The culture of the time was commoners didn't run for office. Commoners shouldn't be in charge. Although you could, while most colonies required you to own land, which meant in the Southern colonies, commoners didn't run for office because you couldn't, you didn't own land. Most, most land was owned by the wealthy, uh, uh, the aristocrats, the gentry, for instance, the big plantation owners. But in the northern colonies, many common people owned land, which meant they could vote, which meant they could run for office. They still didn't. It simply wasn't your place. It's a cultural thing. You should not be running for office unless you are an elite. Because then you have the time available to devote to it. You have the education available to actually make the rules. So even though common people, if you owned land, could actually get involved, they usually didn't. One of the most significant aspects of this early colonial elites and this early assemblies was to limit royal power. They didn't want royal power, in other words, England, they didn't want England to have authority over them. So even by the mid-1700s, we already see many colonial assemblies pulling away from England. 
and wanting independence and freedom. Now, don't get me wrong. They're not talking about independence like independence like the revolution. They're just simply talking about economic independence. In essence, getting to decide who they trade with, getting to decide their own rates, decide who and what pays taxes, decide what goods they want to buy and sell or grow or produce or manufacture. That's the independence we're talking about. Uh, without government controls. So they want to limit the real government controls. The voting requirements I already talked about. Another thing which is very interesting is mobs often express public discontent. Uh, publicly, we see common people dis displaying how if they weren't happy with the rulers or the authority, they would actually run them out of town, literally run them out of town. So if you came along and acted like you were too friendly to England or you weren't friendly with the local economy, they would force you out of office. They would elect someone else. They would kick you out. They would actually run you out of town. Uh, if you appeared that you were being loyal to Catholic belief, for instance, they didn't want you there either. Uh, these colonies were very decidedly Protestant, even though there are Catholics. Any type of Catholic authority, if it ever showed itself, would be immediately attacked by the Protestant majority. So don't ever show any allegiance to Catholicism. Don't show any allegiance to uh, Rome, for instance. Even being too loyal to England could get you in trouble. There was a rising feeling in the northern colonies especially that England was the enemy. Take that carefully, though. I don't mean like military enemy, like, oh, we want to go to war with England. They were the economic enemy. They were who you were competing with when you were producing your goods. The English ships, the English merchants. This idea of English mercantilism, uh, the fact that the English were trying to dominate the shipping and the trade, that was the enemy. So it was enemy based on money really. It was an enemy based on violence or warfare. And these crowd actions are often used to show how they don't like the English. Uh, hell, even prostitution. If a colonial assembly tried to close down a brothel, the crowds might run the person out of town who voted for it. Uh, because common men, especially common laborers in urban areas, they wanted prostitution. Uh, women wanted prostitution. Uh, don't get me wrong, there is, of course, forced sexual slavery. That, that's, that's slavery. But most women in the New England area, they chose prostitution because it was the best paying job you could get. Uh, as, as, well, female prostitutes made more money than men. Uh, so many women chose prostitution. It actually wasn't uncommon for married wives to choose prostitution as well. We see quite a lot of evidence of that to simply supplement the income of a family. I know it really seems odd by our standards, but it just it wasn't looked down upon among commoners that much. Prostitution was was we're not going to say reputable, but it was very common, which is also kind of oddly ironic when you consider how religious the northern colonies were, and yet there was thought to be hundreds of prostitutes in places like uh, Newport or New York or Boston, hundreds of prostitutes. It's really interesting. Um, and the last thing we'll talk about is salutary neglect. England actually exacerbated this, made it worse. England started to relax their controls over the colonies. Why did they relax their controls on the colonies? Because they were making so much money. England's revenues from the colonies were greater than they'd ever achieved in their history. England had never made this type of money before. It made England rich, utterly rich, uh, off of the trade, the taxation, and uh, buying and selling, importing, exporting goods to and from the colonies, Central America, North America, and of course, Africa. So England starts to really relax their controls. This is called salutary neglect. It's got two aspects. The neglect is the relaxed controls. They're relaxing the controls as long as the salutary part, which is the respect part, 
in essence, as long as the colonies recognize England is still in charge and they still they recognize they're still part of England, England relaxes their controls. And they do this through patronage appointments. In essence, England puts figurehead people in charge of colonies as like royal governors, for instance, or tax collectors. Even though the real power in the colonies was the assemblies, England, by putting these figureheads in charge, makes it give the appearances that England is still in charge. England doesn't really care because they're making so much money off of revenue from all the trade that they're just sort of overlooking the colonies. Hey, our governor's in charge. We're getting tax collection, which was really very small. Uh, no real power prestige appointments, prestige positions. And of course we could say officially in parliament, which is England's government, parliament, that's their Congress. Hey, we have we have a royal governor there in charge. We're making all this money. Uh, let's just not worry about it. Let the assemblies think they're in charge. Let the assemblies think that they've got some authority. As long as the money keeps rolling in, we'll leave them alone. Um, now, the colonists took advantage of this. With England relaxing her controls, England using all these patronage appointments, and they were neglecting as long as the colonies were still officially subservient to the, to England. Many assemblies took this as, hey, we're going to, either they took it as, hey, England trust us. I don't know if they were that naive because that wasn't the situation. Some colonial people would probably think that England trust us to govern ourselves, take care of ourselves. Uh, so some people probably thought that. But probably people who were a little more intelligent, a little more in the know, understood this what England was doing, uh, and they took advantage of it. They simply said, "Well, England is looking the other way." How's that? Pro how's that old saying go? Uh, it's not a proverb. How's the saying go? When the cat's away, the mice will play. So, yeah, the cat was looking the other direction. The mice took it upon themselves to try and get control. Here's the problem. Whatever the reason was, either because England people really thought England thought the colonies should have some type of independence, or whether people in the colonies realized England just wasn't paying enough attention, so they were going to get away with things while England wasn't looking, the colonies start to really gain a lot more power and independence. And the colonies, especially the colonial leadership, the elite of the colonies, the educated, the wealthy, start to really think that they've got power and control. What happens after 1750 when England decides to come back and reassert its control over the colonies? Many people in the colonies say, I don't think so. Many people in the colonies resist and say, we don't want you reasserting control. For decades now, you've left us alone and pretty much let us go our own way. We've gotten used to it. And England comes back after 1750 and starts saying, well, you got used to it. Things are going to change now. And many colonial people say, we don't want it to change. Hence the revolution, which we will get to later. That's it for the chapter. I believe we're done with the chapter. So uh, thank you, and we will see you in the next chapter.